Good day, everybody, and welcome to this uh, Engage Customer webinar together with our partners at Ember on how to maximize learning retention to improve employee and customer engagement in your contact center. My name is Steve Hurst. I'm the Editorial Director at Engage Customer. I'm delighted to be joined today by Carolyn Blunt, MD Ember Real Results. How are you today, Carolyn? I'm good, thank you, Steve. How are you? I think the last time we saw each other was um, at the um, Customer Engagement Summit last November, where um, Mike Havard from Ember was chairing the whole event. I think that's right. Uh, possibly, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. back in London today, so if there's background noise, sirens, and things like that, that's why. Because yeah, you're in Trafalgar Square, aren't you? So it's one of the noisiest right. parts of London. So hope they're, they're, hopefully not too much background noise. Great to have you on board for today's webinar, Carolyn. I know that you've got lots to get through, so my, my introduction is going to be very brief. But I was reading uh, part of the synopsis uh, from uh, today's presentation put together by Ember, and um, it came as a, uh, a surprise to me that 50% um, of what you listen to today, if you've forgotten by tomorrow, if we don't fill up within two weeks, that, that may raise, rise to 80%. So we're not very good at retaining knowledge, are we, and, and learning? And I know that today's uh, webinar, Carolyn, you're going to be talking about how um, we can um, retain more and learn more and keep that learning in place. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Uh, welcome to all the delegates to today's webinar as well. And uh, we uh, really do encourage questions to be asked during the webinar. It's a 45-minute webinar. And any questions aren't asked during the answer during the course of this 45 minutes will be answered afterwards. So um, I do encourage you to keep those questions coming. There's a, an Ask a Question button towards the bottom of your screen. So please keep the questions coming, and anything not answered today will be answered afterwards. Uh, I'm not going to say very much more because I know, Carolyn, you've got lots to get through today, and I'm looking forward to learning uh, about uh, learning and, uh, and retaining learning as well. And so, Karen, I'm going to hand this webinar over to you. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, it's not very often we get the luxury of learning about learning, but that's exactly what we're going to do mm. um, today. So when we um, are thinking about learning, we all learn all the time, but it's often unconsciously. Um, most of us can't remember how we learned our first languages or how we learned to walk. Uh, we just did it. Um, but as we get older, it becomes a much more conscious process. So it's quite nice to have some time out to step back and, and really think about that today. And I noticed from the delegate list joining us on the webinar that we've got a lot of L&D professionals um, who will have studied this topic, I'm sure, at length, who will know quite a lot about it as well. So it would be really good to get the chat room going and um, to get some audience participation as we go along as well. So when we're um, thinking about learning retention, there's a few things that um, have struck me throughout my career, uh, which I will touch on in this webinar, because I've been doing this now for about 15 years um, as an L&D professional and specialising in contact centre operations in particular. So I've been very fortunate to be able to work with some fantastic brands over those years and lead projects to develop people um, in contact centre roles, both at frontline level through to leadership programmes. Um, and now we're very much getting into the, the element of digital L&D, and I'll talk more about that and how that works as we go along. But historically, the programmes that we would be involved with might be around culture change in relation to customer service, improving sales performance, um, maximising the effectiveness of induction programmes, um, developing talent from within organisations, and all of those follow a kind of similar pattern, which I'll, which I'll talk about. However, we're now looking at how we can use digital technology and work with people's preferences that, for learning that are changing um, throughout the generational differences as well. So we'll get into some of that. So just a bit of background if you don't already know me or the Ember Group. Um, we're the UK's leading independent customer management consultancy group. There are a number of businesses within our group. Real Results, which I'm the managing director of, is the L&D practice within that. We have Ember Services, which is the consulting arm. We have Mottram Search, which does recruitment and headhunting. And we have a proposition called Ember Analytics, where we look a lot at the content of conversation with technology and use that insight to improve performance, raise the bar in quality, 
And for us as, a, as an L&D part of that group, that is like training needs analysis on steroids. Historically, what would happen when we'd be designing learning interventions is we do a lot of manual call listening. And when I say a lot, we're probably able to scratch the surface of half or 1% of the call volume um, that would be taking place on a daily basis. But with analytics, we're able to test assumptions um, and make sure that the learning that we design is accurate for the, for the benefit that we're trying to achieve. And when it comes to learning retention, having that sort of insight and that data can be really powerful as well. We're actually able to see whether projects have landed the behaviour change that we are training through um, with, with the utmost of percentage accuracies, which is really exciting. So a lot of what we're going to talk about in terms of learning retention today will leverage some of the modern technology that's now at our disposal. So just thinking about why knowledge retention is um, an important topic, I'm sure you know, lots of people who are in L&D will be aware of the stat that you touched on, Steve. You know, it's half of what you listen to on this webinar today, you will forget it unless you are able to make stringent notes, go to the listen again, discuss it with a colleague. There's lots of strategies which, which we'll touch on. But that all takes time and it takes effort. And so it's not uncommon for companies to feel overwhelmed, really, about how they deal with learning retention. Um, and we've touched on the fact that 80% of training can get forgotten if we don't follow it up effectively. And that in itself is a huge amount of wasted revenue. And one of the things that I was really passionate about when I set up Real Results 15 years ago was to think about how we maximize the ROI of our training budgets. Those budgets are usually hard won. Uh, it's also time off the job, which is difficult to negotiate. Um, and if only 20% of that is sticking, then we're really missing a trick. So it's um, a topic that's very close to my heart. And when we think about the average attention span of an adult playing a part in that, um, eight seconds is, is one of the statistics that gets used quite a lot to um, demonstrate that it's less than a span of a, a goldfish. So we really need to think about how we make our learning interventions more exciting, um, make them more sticky, more memorable. And that challenge is increasing with the advent of digital devices, social media, homeworking, dealing with distractions. People's attention spans are getting less and less throughout the generation because of all the plethora of content that's out there. So it's not unusual to really kind of get requests from clients about bite-sized learning, um, how can we learn on the go, what can we do that's going to be new and different. So that's some of the stuff we'll touch on today. So the first topic that I really want to dig into is around how we maximise learning retention. Um, and particularly in contact centre environments, that's um, very much kind of the space that we operate in a lot, but this can also be relevant for field oper operatives, it can be um, retail front end, hospitality, we're doing quite a lot of work with hospitals and medical organisations, but these, these things apply everywhere. Um, and it will have applied actually when you were all in school. And I don't know if you went if you went to university, Steve, but if you did. I did. I went to Cambridge University actually. Thanks for asking, Carolyn. There you go. And did you have a lot of lectures? Too many, in my view. Okay. So the statistics would say that in a lecture environment the chances of a learner retaining much is, is quite slim. And it's not unusual to only retain about five percent of what was talked at you in that environment. Does that sound fair? Sounds very fair to me, yeah. 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 Um, and naturally, if we try to couple that with things like reading and looking at slides and overheads or videos, that can increase. So from 5% 5, 5 of just being talked at, 10% if you, if you read, get it up to 20% if you make that a bit more audio-visual. Um, and maybe if you've got a demonstration by your lecturer at the front of the room, we might get lucky and get as much as 30% uh, from those passive methods where we're almost being spoon-fed that content. 
So when we think about how to up that, it's how do we create more group discussions? And this is very much where a lot of classroom training starts to get focused. So there'll be input, and then people will break out into groups to, to discuss that, <coughs> and replay it. We get it up to about 50% doing that. Um, if we can then create an opportunity for people to practice hands-on, then we're looking to get more like 75%. Have you ever had to do a, a dreaded role play, Steve? Yes, I, yeah, not, not when I was at Cambridge, but I also did a journalism degree. Well, I had an English degree at Cambridge and a journalism degree, and during my journalism degree, uh, there was lots more in the way of group discussion and practice by doing and role-playing. Yeah. So, yes, is the answer to yeah. your question, Carolyn, yeah. Good. So, so what we're seeing is that, you know, often things start to evolve and this theory has become much more known. Um, people also talk about the 70-20-10 method where, you know, it's about how, you know, if we can do 70% of actual learning on the job, that's where we'll really get that knowledge to stick um, and we'll do the smaller amounts by classroom-based and um, sort of those passive input methods. Yeah, I think that's very true. I, 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 I've retained a lot more from my journalism degree than my English degree I think in terms of learnings because of the the way the learning was done uh, you, you can't really uh, with journalism you have to learn it in that way really you can't really learn it in a classroom as such with just a lecture it has mm. to be more hands on yeah so that's pretty common um, and yeah. when I would liken this to kind of how you how you learn to ride a bike and um, because if you try to learn to ride a bike by reading about it or even seeing a video of someone else doing it it, it's not the same as getting on that bike and actually learning for yourself, getting that muscle memory. Agreed. And that's, Agreed. that's where in a, in a classroom environment, as much as learners often hate it, role play and, and skills practice is a really important part and creating that safe environment to actually go through what that simulation could be like is very powerful. Um, and then the other thing we think about usually is a getting to almost like a train the trainer an expert level where we'd be able to take that content and teach other people and if we can do that then we get it up to more like 90 percent um, because that requires the learner to step back and to assimilate and usually get to a, a level where they feel really confident so confidence is a formula of knowledge and experience put together and the more you kind of walk those neural pathways to that content, the more that learning sticks. And that's what we're, we're trying to achieve. So the more we can revisit stuff, the more we can go over it, the better that learning will, will be retained. So these are some of the things to think about when we're building and designing learning interventions. Um, and very much at the heart of how we have approached learning um, throughout Real Results, this kind of projects has been this Confucius quote, and it's a very common quote, gets used a lot in CIPD programs and things like that, um, and it's about, you know, tell me and I forget, show me and I may remember, involve me and I will understand, and that's the basis of that learning pyramid that we've just looked at. Yeah. However, I've added these three little letters underneath it, which look a bit aggressive, they're not meant to be, but GBH... Um, is good but how so that's a, a little acronym that I apply to a lot of our training design when I look at the designs that we're my, me and my team are coming up with I have this GBH kind of rolling around my head all the time good but how how do we actually make sure that that has evolved from just a tell or a show into um, an evolved kind of practice session so that's one of the things I find quite helpful. So when we're looking at how do we involve our learners, one of the problems that we butt up against is the transfer of learning problem. So we might have people feeling quite confident when they leave the classroom environment. We might have created a really great environment for them to do role plays and things in, but how much does that training then affect their behavior once they're back in the workplace and they're on their own, so to speak? Um, that's the transfer of learning problem. So we need to think about how quickly we're getting people to use what they've learned and how supportive is that environment. We know that if we get some positive results from trying that learning out very quickly, then that helps. 
Um, but sometimes we might get some negative consequences because people have misinterpreted what was trained in the classroom and actually we get a behavioural change but it's not the behaviour change that we wanted. Or we might get zero effect, like no behaviour change and you know that is quite common with um, around about 15% of learners, they don't actually ever bother to try to use what they've learned. So um, when we talk about average transfer results, that's fairly common, 15% don't necessarily use it. 15% use it and use it well, and that's great, but it's only 15% we're looking at getting that up in this webinar. And the, the main bulk, so I've got 70% of people there who basically try once, fail, and then never try again. It's too hard. So, you know, one of the things that I usually talk about this with is um, learning to drive. So sometimes when you learn to drive, if you have a bad experience quite early on, it can put you off. And you think, oh, it's too hard, I'll never do it. Like driving on motorways, my best friend's mum still refuses to drive on a motorway. She's in her 60s. She will go down any number of A roads to avoid the motorway. Um, because she tried it once, it was too scary. She got, a, you know, a big <coughs> truck, ride, but never again. Exactly the same um, as my sister. Is it? She there refuses to drive on a motorway. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. Yeah. Not not uncommon. So it's how do we how do we push past that and how do we make sure that that first experience where they're trying that learning out, there's a there's a supportive coach there with them. So that's key part of, you know, failure's gonna happen. We're just going to have to deal with it. You fail fast, you learn. And that's actually one of the things that makes learning more memorable um, and makes you get better at treading those neural pathways. What was it Edison said about the light bulb? I just found however many thousand ways not to do it. Um, so it's about that resilience, really, when it comes to learning. And, we want and then they had a light bulb moment, didn't they, after that? Yeah. <laughs> Finally, yeah. <laughs> and, and we were all very thankful that he didn't give we up, are. right? We are. Yeah, but the the thing about why follow up often fails, even like it's having the time to have that supportive coach dedicated, sat next to them in the passenger seat when they try that out for the first time. Um, so we really need to think about how we're going to build follow up in to our programs, how we're going to provide that resource, whether it's you know managers or coaches or the internal L and D teams um, that could be involved with that. And as a consultancy, sometimes for us that can be a little bit challenging because we want to do that follow-up, but obviously the client has to have the budget to pay for that. So a lot of them will say, no, it's okay, we'll, we'll do that, we'll do that bit ourselves. Um, but then the day-to-day -day job gets in the way or you know, some kind of things happen to the business that weren't predictable and that best intention drops away. Um, so yeah. when we did the survey just to check that, we followed up with 100 delegates that had been on our training courses in the past three months, and um, only 20% of them had received internal support both before and after the training program. Um, so that, again, is a little bit worrying before the program. It's also really important to position what are we going to be learning on this program and why is it important and what do you expect to get out of it so that the mindset is open and ready for learning. So that's definitely one of the things that I would um, encourage all internal L&D experts to think about. And it's a, it's a, often, you know, it is more around resource than motivation as the reasons why, but who else could we involve in that? Who else can take responsibility? And one of the solutions we've been working with our clients on and that is peer-to-peer. -peer. So looking at peer-to-peer -peer social learning and setting up chat groups, even if it's a WhatsApp group, you know, if you don't have a fancy platform, then it's just something like that to say, you know, have you tried that out? What did it go like? What would you do differently next time? That's um, really, really important. So I would encourage um, everybody to think about how we make more of a commitment to build in more follow-up time into all the programs that we design mm -hmm. and deliver. When we did that, and we got clients to do more of that, this is the sort of stuff that delegates were saying. So they were saying it was you know, really positive. It was like one of the best bits of the whole program was that wraparound piece at the end, which consolidated everything, almost gave them the confidence that they were 
doing the right thing and um, really kind of just check back in on that motivation because it just does just dip away sometimes um, once that novelty's worn off you've got to be there ready to swoop back in so that was really key um, and I found that kind of quite enlightening and useful at keeping that focus. Did you, have so, you ever been? Have you ever sort of learnt your? I mean, you're a teacher, obviously, Karen. But uh, have you had any experiences of, of of being coached and mentored that have stayed with you and learning that you've that you've benefited benefited from? Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. I think I think everybody, uh, whether they realise it or not, is coached, mentored, inspired throughout their lives by a number of different people. Um, mm. It could be, you know teachers in school life, parents, family members, um, inspirational industry figures or subject matter experts, colleagues. Um, I think everybody, whether formally or informally, has a number of different uh, coaches and mentors, hopefully, that appear in their lives at just the right moment. Um, and I know particularly I've had a couple of life-changing um, conversations and relationships um, throughout my career that have just kind of pushed me uh, in a different direction, made me think about things a bit differently. Um, so it's just about having that that time really to ask some good questions and yeah. having a formal mentoring or coaching team alongside <clears throat> a long-term development programme is really important to um, to get the best value out of it. Yeah. I mean, they say we all remember our, our sort of, well, at least one of our teachers from school, don't we? Um, a, t a teacher normally that sticks out in our minds from school, and I certainly remember one of my teachers from school, um, yeah. who who actually was a math teacher. He was a fantastic teacher, and he persuaded me to do A level maths, which I regretted within two months of starting the course. But that's another story. Yeah, well, that's it. We all remember a teacher, but hopefully from the positive, yeah. but positive connotations, <laughs> just the negative ones. Um, so one of the things that we are, as an industry in L&D, uh, we've been talking about for some time, a bit of a buzzword, is blended learning. So it's, what does that really mean and what's the impact of that upon learning retention? And I'll be the first to hold my hand up. You know, I'm a bit of a veteran in L&D and it was very much classroom-led delivery that um, I was always involved with. And when things started to get a bit more digital, um, you know, social media was getting into our contact centers as a channel and there was all this buzz around e-learning. I wasn't sure how effective it was really going to be in that, you know, you can do so much in a face-to-face -face environment when it comes to developing people skills and leadership skills, all those soft skill role plays that we talked about being really helpful. How do you do that in a e-learning product? And a lot of the e-learning that was coming out in the early days was pretty flat, kind of two-dimensional, click next, and then you might have a quiz at the very end, um, and you had to read a lot of text on the screen. It wasn't, it wasn't particularly exciting. So I think I kind of resisted how effective e-learning could be, but I think we've certainly embraced that now as an industry and gone, actually, there is a lot here that we can really use in L&D effectively. We've got much better platforms to create really exciting, uh, intriguing programs for our learners, um, and we can create all sorts of activities around that. So 78% of organizations now use e-learning, and I think that's great. However, I do still think we need to look at how we wrap the whole bit around because we need to be sure that the e-learning is actually effective. So we'll say, yeah, 53% of organizations have increased their use of e-learning, but is it effective? We know that somebody's completed the e-learning. Maybe they've even passed the test within the e-learning, but do they retain that knowledge or have they just learned how to skim read and complete a quiz? As far, as far as you're aware, Karen, is that 78 percent? Is that trending upwards? Is that uh, it, it seems a very it's more than three in four organisations already. Is that on an upward curve? That figure, as far as you know, or, or? it is, and it varies yeah. across different industries. Though, so we're finding, you know, there are certain industries where it's less. Um, and there are certain topics where it's less. So it's very, very prevalent in things like um, health and safety, compliance, money laundering, you know, all the kind of stuff that you have to be able to prove to um, legal entities that you have ticked a box. 
and it's been less used for some of the soft skills right. um, that yeah. we would traditionally have done in a classroom. But what we're seeing now is actually we can use it for some of the soft skills, but it's still helpful to be able to have face-to-face -face support and a conversation and somebody to think out loud with after you've done that learning and to say, you know, what did you find and how are you going to use it and just to reinforce that. Yes. Um, yeah. And um, one of my concerns, even around using e-learning for compliance, is I have been in contact centres where advisors are very aware that they have to pass this piece of e-learning every 12 months and they have to um, complete, complete the module and they just almost keep the answers in their drawer and they just get them out and they re redo the quiz every year and that's then compliant for another year. Yeah. But are they actually applying on a day-to-day -day basis what that e-learning contained? It's hard to say. That really is just a tick box, isn't it, as you said, yeah. 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 So we developed a tool to be able to test that, which I'll come on to, because okay. um, it was something that was a little bit concerning in a way. So very quickly, when we're looking at modern day learning, what we're thinking about is how we move through these different stages. Usually, it can be anything from sort of three to 12 months in, in this kind of timeline, where we would focus on these different stages, and we would look at the development part, which is really kind of getting into what the nuances are of the particular organisation. So this is kind of your training needs analysis or identifying learning needs diagnostic phase. And um, so we do the development. Then we would move into getting into the creative, which is my favourite element to a large extent, where you really go wild with kind of um, the themes and all that good stuff. Mm. And then we're getting into the delivery, which is where a lot of people focus the effort around classroom and think about how do we make sure that learning intervention gets good feedback from the learners, which is great. But really what we're focusing on today is the measure and embed piece and how do we make sure that that learning has been retained, has been applied and has achieved the, the real result that we set out to get. And then this train the trainer section is how do we create that sustainability. Um, so there are a number of different touch points that um, we would connect into to make sure these work. And particularly that creative piece, the campaign hook. Um, it's now, we're now thinking about having learning not just as a course or a program, but as a learning campaign. And how do we kind of create interest before, during and after? So coming up with a logo, a title, um, setting out some curiosity, all of that good stuff is really important. When it comes to stakeholder involvement, we would um, want senior leaders to be involved in the program. And that might be coming in to open the program physically, or it might be create a digital kind of talking head, almost a video that we push out before the program. Even a webinar like this can be really, really helpful. Um, and getting people aware of why are we doing this and what do they need to think about before they come along is really useful. Um, and that's where, again, you can start to bring digital into that piece as well. Um, so, so, Carolyn, I've done 150 webinars in the last sort of six, seven years. So I've actually done quite a bit of e-learning without probably realising it. Was that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. And this is it. A lot of people don't always realise. You do mm. a podcast, you listen to a podcast, you go on a webinar. You know, mm. those are the sorts of things that, you know, you read a blog. It's e-learning. It's digital learning. I think, yes. you know, we've got kind of these two labels. E-learning, it feels more like, you know, that's a module that you go onto a learning management system, it's recorded, you know, you go in and complete it. And digital learning is is learning by osmosis in all of these kind of interactions all the time. And yes. this is how people are telling us they want to learn in the modern day. So we need to build that into our program. Um, we, we know from research that's been conducted that about 50% of team leaders in contact centres say they want to learn on the go. They'll learn on their commute. They'll read things, they'll listen to things, they'll watch TED Talks or whatever. Um, but that is all kind of content-based digital learning, which is great. So we just need to look at how can we leverage that in the programs that we're designing within the organizations. 
and I think there's still the place for the classroom delivery. Um, but we, you know, we've just got to make sure that we're blending it and that we're doing it with those digital resources and we're making it as bite-sized as possible. So this is where the attention span piece comes in. You know, the days in the 90s where we used to go away for leadership programs in a five-star hotel for a week, those are long gone. You know, that's mm. not how that's not how it works anymore. Um, it's very much power hours, half days. You know, and that whole wraparound. And um, when it comes to how we do the measure and embed piece, again, that's dependent upon the intensity of the program, how quickly we want to do that follow up, what resources we've got. But certainly having a one to one coach can be really helpful. Doing these kind of buzz sessions, huddles. Um, we were with a contact centre the other week and we were talking about how do we start to embed what, what we're covering in the digital and the classroom <coughs> solutions within the team meetings, the huddles, the quality framework, the HR processes. It's all about how we build that end-to-end -end solution that's important. Yeah. And ultimately, you know, we want in our contact centres our knowledge bases to be consistent with the messages we're training through and to continue to support that. And I'm seeing too many long induction programmes that have content overload. People are in the, the induction for six, eight, ten weeks sometimes, um, and then they go out onto the floor and they don't cover half of what they went through in the induction in the calls that they're dealing with for months afterwards. And then when that question finally comes up from a customer, induction was, you know, six months ago. It's, and it's gone, gone. Yeah. So we really need yeah. to have the right knowledge base and we need to look at how do we drip feed and embed content all the way through. And that's where our kind of idea came along where we said, actually, we want to develop a digital platform that would keep in touch with learners every single day. So this is kind of a quick win compared to that uh, more robust timeline. And we called it Errol, which is Ember Real Results Online Learning. And it's a very cute owl, as you can see. Um, and what Errol does is he sends a question to the learner through an email every single day. And that question links back either to the induction content or the program culture change, product knowledge, whatever you want it to be. And that learner can then click on that, answer the question. If they get it right, then great. We can put them into the leaderboard and we can align rewards to all of that. If they get it wrong, that's the really interesting part. What we then can do is push them to a link in the learning management system that says, here's the right piece of content to, to go back to. Because a lot of clients will say, we've got a learning management system, we've got some good modern content in it, but nobody's using it. No, you know, The traffic, the volume isn't good, or people are only doing it with mandatory and not voluntary. And this is one really smart way to drive that learner forward to the relevant content that they need. And it's also the solution to the problem we were talking about earlier, where people just complete e-learning in a mandatory capacity and, we, and don't touch it again for another 11 and a half months. This yeah. is a way of proving to industry regulators that my people are actually compliant because I'm testing them every single day, week, month. Um, related to that, it's, it's extremely. I must, I must say, Karen, Errol looks very wise, very, very, yes. very acute. What, what does Errol stand for again? Does, does, the, does the letters stand for something? Do they? E yes. R R O L. What does it stand for again? Yes. So it's Ember Real Results Online Learning. Right. Okay. Nice one. Yeah. Hmm. I can't claim I like credit. Like Simon Foot came up with that. I Did he? Claim... Uh, yeah, I know he... Simon quite well. It's typical of the sort of thing he'll come up with, actually. <laughs> And it's a very, he was very pleased with himself, I think, because it's a trainery thing to kind of come up with an acronym. Trainers love an acronym. Mm. Um, and, and again, because it makes things more memorable, um, that's yeah. one of the ways in which people can retain information. So yeah. that's, that's why we called him Errol. Yeah. But how is um, Errol actually, going down? Is Errol going down well? Is Errol. Um... Yeah. yeah, yes, he is. And um, and actually, if your listeners on the webinar or the replay would like to meet Errol in person, then we're we're very happy to provide a demo of the functionality and the actual platform itself and what that looks like. 
um, and we would also be happy to give them five additional ERIL licenses free of charge if they place an order for 30 or more with your Engage 5 free code. So I've put that up on the screen and um, people are more than welcome to contact me afterwards if they're interested in setting that up because we don't have much more time to go into that and mindful we said we'd have a look at some questions that people may have as Absolutely, well. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I, I think I'll certainly um, take you up on the Errol offer myself, actually. looks very interesting. Um, Karen, thanks for that. Uh, great presentation. And uh, uh, without being too cliched about it, I think I learned a lot from it. And as I said right at the top of the show, um, uh, just reading the synopsis for the presentation, um, it, 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 I learned that um, about 50% of what you listen to today you will have forgotten by tomorrow. Uh, and uh, I really like the Confucius quote as well um, that you've used. I know it's a well-known quote, but... I think in terms of this webinar, also a very, very appropriate one as well. So thanks, Karen, very much indeed for that. Um, got a question here for you from Rehan Azal. Um, uh, thanks for the question, Rehan. Rehan is um, an organizational development specialist at The Growth Company. Um, and uh, it's quite a long question, Car Caroline, but I think it's worth asking. Um, many organizations are moving towards e-learning. However, despite the advances in technology, and I think you've answered to some extent, how can, how can companies ensure that staff engage fully with learning and what strategies can companies employ to ensure that staff don't see it as a tick box exercise and actually apply what they learn through e-learning in real life? Okay, that's a really good question. And mm. yeah, we've talked about it being part of a campaign um, and something that's desirable and exciting to do, not just, you know, you have to complete this. Um, for legal reasons. Um, so we do have lots of great platforms available now to create e-learning within and actually a lot of the limitation is simply imagination. Um, mm -hmm. So it's how do you take that topic and make it more, more exciting? How can you create curiosity um, and make a game and you know make sure that there are rewards for those who who do well with the game um, so that it's not just people learning at the desk on their own with a headset it might be part of a, a team or a social platform you've got to engage the managers in that that they're cheerleading and encouraging people to to do that um, so you know, there's numbers of different ways that that can be approached. A very um, exciting one that we were shown recently around GDPR was linked to the Matrix. You know, the film. Yes, the I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, remember that. And it was yeah, so it was very much themed around that. And you know, you you became a special secret agent, and you had to go through the contact center and um, note note down what bits of um, kind of GDPR breach there were around the place. And then, you know, that, that was all then fed into leaderboards and you're able to see who's who's the best secret agent and all of that. And it's just about the le getting that learning across. That actually, if you leave your PC unlocked or, um, you know, data on a whiteboard in a contact center, then that's potentially breaching uh, yeah. GDPR next year, this year from May. So, yeah, stuff like yeah. that, I think you can, you can make boring topics exciting if you try hard enough. So, so is it fair to say that gamification, is, I think it's called gamification, I think that's the overarching term, is becoming more and more important in in e-learning or, or in, in digital learning? Yes, I would say it's a good, yeah. it's a, it's, you know, people like to compete, uh, it gives us a, a reason to kind of do something a lot of the time. I know I compete on my horse for fun at the weekends, which sounds a bit mad, but that's what motivates me to train during the week when it's snowing and freezing and all of that good stuff because I want to do well. So it's Is that Jim Connors and that kind of stuff, Carolyn, those sort of things? Uh, dressage, dressage, yeah. Dressage, okay. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, but that, you know, that's one of the motivating factors of human behaviour. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thanks for that. I've uh, got another question here from uh, David Butterfield, who's head of L&D at Aggregate Industries. Thanks for the question, David. Um, uh, Karen, what advice do you have about frequency of coaching following training to embed the learning? Again, I think you've touched on that, but it's a specific question here from David about frequency, which I think is um, another good question. 
Yeah, really good question. And um, there isn't a black and white answer to that because it's about how confident uh, the person is. So as I mentioned before, confidence is um, a sum of knowledge and experience. So if somebody is relatively experienced with something, you might only coach once a month, once a week, something like that. But if somebody is less experienced, they might need daily keeping in touch, kind of how is it going. They might the day and the end of the day and um, if it's a brand new starter who's not confident they need a floor walker around them all the time so it, it kind of depends I use the situational leadership model a lot um, in our program and explain about the d1 to d4 levels of competence in an individual so we're all situationally competent at either d1 or d4 at different stages of our lives with different tasks um, and that determines how much coaching you need or not. Right. Does it also uh, is it also depend on 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 the content of actually what's being learnt? If you know what I mean, the frequency yeah. of coaching. Yeah. Yeah. How complicated it is. Yeah. How well how well supported is it with the knowledge base and the other things that we've talked about? Um, you can do some. You can do virtual coaching. Doesn't always have to be physical face to face. You can also do stuff over the telephone. Um, you know, so for home workers. You know, it might be that we do more conversations, but those conversations aren't face to face. So it just depends what it is we're trying to achieve. So it's horses for courses to some extent, Karen. Yeah. yeah. Nice pun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you got that one. Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, quite another question from um, uh, from David Jenkins. Uh, David, David, thanks for the question. David is operational performance manager at Cambridgeshire County Council. Um, and uh, David says, um, Karen, have you got any specific tips for embedding learning in a contact centre environment, which is obviously your expertise, where releasing members of staff for training is difficult? So any specific tips for embedding learning in a contact centre environment where releasing members of staff for training is difficult? Well, that's exactly what we designed Daryl for. Um, so that's one way in which people can revisit classroom or other content um, at their desktop in under 60 seconds. So it's a micro learning tool, which is one of the big focuses of L&D this year, um, to look at how can we speed up and condense learning to make it quick. Um, and then we can build on that because if somebody's come out of an induction program and they know, um, you know, 80% of topic A but only 20% of topic B, then Errol will flag that up. And that might be different to the person who sat next to them who might be the complete opposite in what they've taken on board and retained. So having a tool like Errol gives really good reporting insights so that my coaching can be really focused and tailored or my next follow-up intervention or the next piece of digital content that I direct you to in your learner pathway is geared to that. Okay. Is Errol, is Errol I mean, um, uh, he's a lovely owl and, um, and it's, it's a great acronym, but is Errol new and... and um, it, have you just launched Errol? Is it a, is it a brand new departure for your Ember uh, real results? No, it's not brand new. It's no. been out for about six months. Okay. So, yeah, so we've had a, a number of clients come on board in the early phase to make, make that happen. He's now on his fourth iteration of development and improving all the time. And we've had a lot of input from clients about those developments uh, that they like to see with him and how they use him is very different. Uh, in different organisations, but the overwhelmingly positive feedback about that from the learners, from the L and D teams, uh, from the compliance teams. Um, it's a it's a really great way of um, also managing remote workers, looking to get data from offshore or outsourced operations as well. So um, very very versatile. Okay, thanks, that. Um... We're almost out of time now, Karen. But just what, just one final question for you, as as a uh, an overarching question, as an expert trainer. Um, what, what, how, how do you see the future for this kind of e-learning? Uh, is, has it got a bright future? And we've already talked about three and four organisations are using e-learning. How do you see e-learning uh, evolving, developing, and um, are there new techniques that and tools that will be coming along from your experience, from what you know about e-learning, that um, people can look forward to? I think, it's going to get, 
I think it's going to get more creative. I think the interventions are going to get shorter and shorter. So they won't be, you know, kind of 20, 30 minute modules. They'll be, you know, under five minutes. Um, and, you know, millennials are telling us that they will leave the organization if they don't feel that they are learning fast enough. So having a very wide range of digital learning topics that people can self-direct and draw down and access when they want, where they want, is going to be essential. Okay, Karen, thanks for that. Um, thanks for a great presentation today. Thanks to our audience for some great questions. Thanks to Ember for sponsoring today. You will see um, on the final holding slide we've got there some of the events we've got coming up um, in the near future. In fact, you mentioned GDPR, Karen, and we do have some sessions on GDPR, which comes into effect, as you mentioned, on May the 25th at our CX Marketing uh, Summit, which is only next week on March 15th. So thanks again, Caroline, um, and uh, and um, this webinar will be available on demand for six months after today. So if there's lots, lots of material here from Caroline and um, lots of really good information. So if you want to revisit the webinar in the next six months, that's great. You can do that, and it will be available on demand, I think, from later on today or from tomorrow. So it just leaves me to thank everyone, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.